let's get the going and uh, let me start with uh, uh, with uh, a fitting joke uh, in this case, which uh, uh, I think uh, some of you may have uh, uh, seen that about a front end developer and their knowledge of uh, SQL. Why front end developers eat alone? Uh, well, because we don't know how to join tables, right? And uh, I think this is very relevant uh, because indeed uh, in the modern uh, technical community, we have a huge, huge uh, split of a different uh, knowledge, uh, right? There are some people who uh, really know databases and SQL language pretty well. And there are also some uh, the other developers which uh, are uh, really uh, writing applications those days which may not uh, know the uh, database technology. Uh, that uh, well, right? Including uh, uh, the, you know, what is a join. Now, if you think about the most teams, uh, what I commonly see is this kind of a great split between the developers and uh, the technical uh, technical operations. Now, if you think about the uh, operations, these are folks which uh, are focused on. Uh, the database, uh, right? Uh, something like DBAs or uh, database architects or database reliability engineer, right? The titles have been evolved. Or there are some generalists which are also in charge of a data uh, database as a part of a whole, like sysadmins, uh, site reliability engineers, and uh, so on and, uh, and so forth, right? We have this kind of two uh, classes of people. Now, if you look at the, uh, a lot of uh, organizations, especially larger ones, we see there is uh, a lot of tension between the developers and ops, right? Now, if you uh, uh, think about that, there is a modern uh, concept, well, not super modern those days, right? I mean, it's uh, more than five years uh, old called DevOps, which was recognizing that and exactly focused on bridging the gaps between devs and ops. Right. In reality, we see not all the organizations, especially large one, really adopted that very well, uh, especially when it comes to the databases. Because databases, they're kind of uh, its own uh, often special snowflake compared to other parts uh, of, uh, of the infrastructure. Right. So, for example, one of our approaches with uh, um, uh, DevOps, uh, you think about their uh, continuous uh, deployment then you know you can really deploy things uh, quickly if you break something you can quickly fix it that is not how things work with database especially large one if you drop the table you didn't intend to well chances are it will take a time to recover it from backup if you need to run the alter table right to uh, you know add an index or column to chances are that will take significant uh, point of time, right? So the databases uh, still require a special care, even if organizations which are having that DevOps uh, approach. Now, what I think is uh, even more interesting is if you look at the uh, very large operations, you often have an operations team, which is very siloed um, as well, right? Like we may have folks who are, uh, focused on storage and network and particular operating system, right? And if certain things are not uh, uh, working right, they may be mm, pointing uh, finger to uh, everyone, right? And then there is also uh, security folks which can, you know, establish some uh, additional uh, roadblocks, uh, be uh, as a security uh, uh, rules uh, or policies and so on. Uh, in the nutshell, very often uh, see the developers thinking about the database uh, that can be explained this uh, simple way, right? From developer side, it is like uh, the question of why this stupid database is always a problem. Why it's always stop working and I am not doing anything wrong. Because from development standpoint, they are or if you don't understand how a database works internally, they're just you know sending queries, and one query may not be different from an other from their standpoint. But in reality, changing you know some sin, uh, single clause from end to or may uh, make a query 
thousand times more complicated, right? And take thousand times longer to complete. From operations people, or, and I mean, in this case, the people who really understand and care about the databases, uh, there is always a question about developers. Why you do not learn the database design? Why do you create the tables with no proper indexes? And then, uh, you know, uh, scream bloody, bloody murder when the things do not work, right? Why do you not uh, write optimized queries, right? Like go through a process of assessing how optimal query is before putting that uh, in production. Why don't you think about the capacity planning, right? Again, in a lot of um, cases I see uh, developers think, you know, databases can magically handle that, right? Not really you know, assessing uh, how much of workload uh, data queries uh, it can happen. And all that uh, gets to their uh, conflict. Now, if you look at uh, one thing I want you to take away from this presentation before we go at the practices for developers is what, if you look at the successful database operations, right? If you really want to build the um, large scale successful database part application, you need to understand what database responsibility is a shared responsibility between devs and ops, right? And uh, uh, folks need to uh, uh, work that uh, together right, to, to resolve the problem. Nothing else uh, really will uh, will work. Okay, now with that out of the way, let's go uh, and talk about uh, some of the talk re recommendations I have for, uh, for developers. Now, the first thing is what you really need to understand how a database works, at least on a high level, uh, uh, on a high level. Right. If you really think a database is a black box and you are, you know, just going to Google and just copy paste those create statements and some queries, you won't be able to uh, build the large scale applications. Right. Maybe you will be able to mm, go by with uh, some, you know, tiny demos, but it will all uh, 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 crash and down sooner sooner than uh, you would hope, uh, right? Uh, because of uh, all that uh, complexity which database entails. Uh, specifically, you want to you want to learn the schema design, the uh, power of a database language such as SQL, and in particular, how the database mm, uh, executes uh, mm, uh, the query, at least in high level details. So here is example of a database uh, relational schema, right? MySQL, Postgres, uh, Oracle, on a high level, uh, it is a, a relational schema is the same. This is a set of tables with uh, relationships between them. I think it is a very uh, important to uh, be able to uh, understand and represent your schema as a uh, uh, at the such set of uh, set of tables. Now, if you look at the query execution, I would uh, encourage you to understand query execution at least on uh, on this level. This is how a query executed on uh, MySQL side from again very high level point of view. But this is already very helpful because it uh, explains you, for example, what hey there is a parser which which. Uh, Part of the query, there is something that optimizes the query and come by with a query optimize, uh, query execution plan, which is uh, later than executed, right? A lot of uh, mm, uh, developers uh, uh, I met, they are not really able to explain the database operation, uh, database query execution, even on this very high level. Uh, the very important piece, if you really want to have uh, one thing you as developer need to know uh, about the database is the explain, how query is executed, uh, right? And uh, you need to uh, have to know two things about explain. A, how your current query is, uh, is executed, and B, how things will change uh, with your application changes. Right, because uh, typically the, the test query is in a test environment with maybe some very small data sets. And uh, as database gets larger, then uh, certain things, uh, certain queries can become substantially slower, right? Which 
actually if you analyze if you uh, take a careful look at explain you often you'll be able to see that this is a visualized uh, datagram which is from MySQL workbench which has this fantastic query visualization tool and then um, also you can uh, read about uh, execution plan information and uh, manual uh, uh, to read explain better right i don't have a time uh, specifically to go uh, into that uh, the postgresql you know, obviously has uh, has a similar feature right like uh, in this case i am uh, using the tool uh, uh, called to uh, uh, PAV, right? There is a link uh, down there which uh, uh, shows uh, uh, how you can visualize a plan, right? Again, uh, very, uh, a very good tool. And uh, both those visualization tools are basically for uh, for convenience. Uh, it is, I think, even better uh, to get the skills to uh, execute the raw textual output plan as a database uh, a database generates right uh, when you don't have to ex uh, rely on this uh, additional level of um, parsing from uh per corner side uh, uh we uh, are helping you to understand uh, the queries uh, for uh, all the open source database we support with our tool called pmm per corner monitoring and uh, and management which can show you uh, what queries are causing the load on the system, or you can also see what are the slowest queries, what queries are causing temporary tables, uh, and so on and so forth, as well as why you're, they're causing this load, where you can take a look at uh, a specific query and understand uh, what is... Uh, what, is uh, what is this? um uh the the what is the query uh taken right like in this case uh, uh, we can see uh for example what uh, this query takes uh this io takes only three percent of the query execution time that means adding more memory or getting faster disk is not going to improve that query performance and also how to optimize uh, this query performance which uh, uh, we do by providing the most important uh, information about a query such as uh, query example it's so you understand what query you're optimizing their um, query output uh, explain output and uh, show create tables for in involved tables right typically using that information you are able to uh, understand how to optimize uh, your query. So, if you want to check uh, out PMM more, uh, here is a demo, pmmdemoperconn.com, where you can uh, do mm, a lot of uh, stuff without, um, you know, check out a lot of the features without installing that. And also, just yesterday, we released the new version of PMM 2.6, uh, if you uh, want to check that out. Okay. Moving on, the next thing uh, uh, that you need to understand about query execution is how queries are executed on a very high level, right? And again, for some of the MySQL old timers, that's maybe uh, look like a stupid question, right? A very uh, basic question, but a lot of uh, new Mm, uh, developers coming into the system with no have a preconceived notions, they may uh, not really expect uh, the behavior which many databases have, right? Think about that. You have a database cluster, for example, of five nodes, which uh, each has uh, have, you know, tens of CPU cores. And if you throw the complicated query on this cluster, as a reasonable person, how would you ex expect that to be executed? Well, Probably you would uh, expect uh, uh, th that to be executed by using all the resources which are available on that uh, cluster. Well, indeed, that is how things work with some of the database technologies. Like if you think something uh, like uh, Hadoop or uh, ClickHouse, indeed, when you send the query in, it can use all CPU cores, like all resources on all the nodes uh, which correspond to a cluster. But that is not how uh, MySQL or Postgres works. The Postgres actually has a parallel query mm, 
uh, of uh, features, right? That means uh, it uh, can it typically uh, use uh, all the resources on the sin single node, right? All the uh, all the CPU cores, uh, uh, right? With uh, some level uh, of uh, of efficiency. When you look at the MySQL, though, it does not, right? And this uh, and their complicated uh, select queries or some you know large scale update queries, alter table, they all are executed essentially in a single thread, uh, bound by the single CPU core, right? Which is uh, which is an important uh, limitation of that technology. And as you're building your application, you need to know that. Because what you don't want to happen is you don't want to be developing your system on a single uh, single node, uh, let's say to four CPU core system, and thinking, oh, you know what? It's no problem. I can make my queries a lot faster by uh, getting 64 node box and then finding out what, no, you don't, because single query uh, can only run on a single CPU core in a technology you, mm, uh, that you have chosen. Indexes. The thing about the indexes is uh, indexes are absolutely critical when it comes to uh, uh, to conventional uh, uh, relational database, right? So uh, you really need to make sure your performance critical queries have the uh, indexes they need. At the same time, indexes are expensive. Indexes slow things down. Right, slow things down when a query cannot use those uh, uh, those indexes. Now, a lot of people understand mm, what indexes slow down queries, uh, uh, update queries, right, or uh, modifications, inserts, deletes. Because when I am uh, updating the data, I potentially need to update all my indexes, and the more indexes ha I have, the slower things are going to become. Right, that is. Uh, are pretty clear. At the same time, that also up to, uh, applies to selects, because the more indexes you have, the more your data size will take. So possibly it will not have as uh, good cache uh, hit uh, anymore. And then uh, uh, also uh, the, the optimizer will have to do a lot more work uh, figuring out what indexes um, what indexes to use. Right. So. In the, uh, so do add indexes, but do not add the indexes you do not need. Actually, uh, this brings us to a very kind of telltale style about the bad indexes practices, right? There are two. If you give me their uh, database schema dump, like MySQL dump, often I can very easily spot when um, uh, folks do not have proper indexing skills in the team. The first one is if I uh, see pretty much only primary keys created in the system, right? That means people do not understand indexes. They created primary keys because they had to or because they have been automatically created for them. Now, the second thing is if I see uh, almost every column indexed, right? Because some people, uh, they take a very simplified approach to index and they go to Google and in Google, they see, well, if you have uh, the column as a part of a where clause, I, you should index that. That is, a, that is a bad idea. Don't index all, com uh, all columns. And in many cases, you want to build the uh, multi-column indexes for better performance, not building indexes separately on uh, all the different platforms. The next uh, thing is capacity planning. Uh, no database really have uh, unlimited scale, right? You always have to def design for the load uh, uh, you have. And, this, uh, and the, also the scalability mm, is a very uh, application dependent. Now, what is interesting in this case is you can tell, well, there are some technologies provided by the cloud vendors being, you know, DynamoDB or Google Spanner, Cosmos DB, right, which promise pretty much unlimited um, scalability. Well, the thing that they promise you is uh, what uh, you run out of money faster than they run out of uh, scalability resources, right? There is actually some design goals and those systems are uh, not unlimited in scale. Well, frankly, there is uh, the, a limit to the 
uh, scale of uh, those cloud vendor scale, right? And we actually have seen what uh, during the early days of uh, COVID pandemics, many cloud vendors experienced the capacity limits, right? Because uh, people try to, who have been uh, increasing the traffic, have been trying to uh, scale the instances um, and they couldn't, right? Now, another thing to understand is what the scalability is a very, very uh, application dependent, right? It may not be just about the database system, but in terms of how your application works. So, for example, uh, if you uh, the, uh, want to, mm, you know, troll some of those cloud vendors, you can ask somebody saying, hey, uh, does your database support million updates a second? Right, and you probably would say, "Oh, sure, for Google Spanner, Cosmos DB, whatever, that is not a problem at all." Right, but then you can say, "Well, you know what? I need all those updates to happen to exactly the same row." Right, and then you probably say, "Oops, that is not going to work," because serialized updates mm, to the single row, right? They really have, uh, uh, well. Uh, uh, they really have that serialization problem, right? Which uh, uh, introduces the scalability limits in this case. Now, of course, your application is unlikely to be that application where all load is just hitting uh, all updates on one row. But it is also probably is not going to be that perfectly scalable application, which uh, vendors uh, tend to use uh, as a showcase for how well the technology scales. So what you want to make sure is you always take those promises with a grain of salt and do your own measurements, right? Do your own measurements in terms of uh, whatever mm, extent of scalability of the systems for you. Also pay attention to efficiency, right? Why is that important? Because if you look at, um, at the, in the cloud space, especially going to a higher instance, uh, size or larger number of instances is a fair play in terms of optimization, right? It's kind of called tuning by the credit card in many cases. Uh, but that is something which uh, can uh, really take you down the very wrong path where your application uh, will be working and maybe working with a good performance, but it will be horrendously inefficient. And that means it will be uh, bad for your wallet and the and bad for environment too, you know, wasting all those uh, CPU cycles. Another thing when you uh, you need to know when you talk about scaling is this difference between uh, uh, vertical scaling and uh, uh, horizontal scaling, right? These are typically two important approaches uh, which uh, we talk about scaling data uh, uh, data centers. Now, if you think about those approaches. The only one which takes you to extreme scale is horizontal scaling. You cannot build a Facebook scale application, for example, by uh, buying a very large single server. There is not such a large you know, single server for sale. But for many small and medium scale applications, which are majority by the numbers, you can actually uh, get by with a, a single powerful instance often uh, having your uh, architecture much more simple uh, and cost-effective be because of that, right? That's why scalability uh, and, uh, and uh, analysis and performance uh, and capacity planning is important because maybe you don't need the complexity for a scale you are targeting for uh, a foreseeable future, right? Uh, I think it's also, Good to point out what uh, uh, the scalable and efficient that are uh, kind of maybe, uh, often seen by people as a similar terms, but they're very different. And in fact, many systems which you uh, which focus extreme scalability, they are not very efficient at that because from software engineering choices, right, it's uh, extremely hard, not expo impossible, but extremely hard to build the systems which are very scalable and uh, mm, uh, very efficient at the same time. Now, uh, another thing which I, uh, another terms which I uh, hear people using interchangeably is uh, the throughput and latency. 
again, is a very uh, important and different, especially for uh, distributed systems, right? Like, for example, you may hear something like, oh, uh, yeah, my storage can handle 10,000 IOPS a second, which sounds like fast, right? But uh, that well may happen with, uh, the, let's say, 5 millisecond latency, which uh, means it will require a lot of concurrent IOPS to achieve that number. And with 5 millisecond latency, uh, your storage will not be very fast from a storage, uh, from a user experience, right? Uh, again, uh, understand the difference between uh, between uh, uh, between uh, those uh, things and uh, test to understand what exactly uh, you are uh, he uh, you are hearing, right? And why this is important because in marketing materials you often would uh, hear claims about throughput because throughput is easier to reach than latency, uh, right? And especially predictable low latency, that is uh, uh, a, a really hard uh, problem. Uh, here's something which is uh, relatively unrelated to the topic of presentation, but I think that is a fantastic picture for many of us to, uh, to know, is uh, the mm, latency, uh, right? Or uh, the timing for uh, different, uh, operator, uh, different operations. And I think what is especially cool is if you go to a website, they have a diagram how those latencies have changed through different years. So you can really see what not every mm, uh, component is improving at the same speed, right, at the same rate. Like for example, uh, speed of light is not getting any faster, right? So a lot of things when uh, uh, transmitting data a distance concern, uh, we may be, you know, trimming a little bit of latency through uh, as it goes through some processing hardware, but there is very little we can do in terms of a uh, distance. Getting back to specifically speed of light limitations, that is uh, where you really need to consider that for high availability choices. Because uh, the holy grail of high availability is to say, well, you know what, I want to have a system where I have uh, nodes in different countries, one in, let's say, US, either in Europe, a third in South America, right, for example. So it's really reliable, right? And then I want to make sure I have my uh, rides and they're very fast as well. Well, it doesn't really work this way, right? You have to choose if you're using asynchronous replication, in this case, propagation will be delayed, or you will have to pay uh, for latency, right? It's uh, one, uh, uh, one of the two. And in many cases, what makes sense uh, actually is to uh, build the cluster, for example, if in a same region, multiple availability zone with synchronous replication, and then for disaster recovery, use asynchronous replication to propagate data to some entirely different uh, region in case the whole uh, region uh, fails. Especially, you need to understand what the wide area networks, so networks which operate between different regions, different continents, they are different from your uh, local networks. The, they tend not to be as, uh, mm, uh, as reliable especially when it comes to a single packet delivery, right? And you should expect increased jitter, meaning sometimes your latency spikes 10 times from when it's normal, right, for five minutes and then go back to normal. Or maybe, you know, things will uh, go down for 30 seconds and then uh, recover. It's normal for wide area network, but it's uh, probably not for your local area. Uh, network and you need, especially in a data center level, and you'd need to uh, make sure the system you deploy is uh, uh, ready for that. Uh, another big thing to which latency drives is what the connections to the database are expensive, especially if you use uh, SSL or uh, TLS and the query latency add up, especially on the real network, even in a data center, not on your local laptop, right? Where uh, there is almost no latency going from your uh, you know, no JS to your database server, right? Running in, in the same place, right? Query latency, uh, that is something which, uh, 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 as example, I have seen some developers, they have extremely high number of uh, queries because they just don't want to learn SQL features, 
right? I have seen people instead of having one query with maybe a couple of joins to fetch uh, uh, the table, they would essentially have series of queries for every single cell of a table uh, they're drawing, creating tens of thousands of queries for a single page view, right? Very bad practice, very inefficient, uh, a lot of load on database, uh, high latency and so on and so forth. Now, uh, many uh, frameworks those days, they are using the ORM called like o object relational mapping. And some people hate ORM, some people absolutely love them, right? In reality, it is a fantastic tool in terms of it's allowing developers to query database without the need to understand SQL. But it also can create SQL, which is horrifically inefficient. What is important here is what you want to learn uh, uh, your framework. Many of them support hints to help uh, the SQL uh, generation. And also uh, be ready to manually write SQL if there is no choice. There are questions, even the most modern, best ORM framework where screw up and going to have a horrible, horrible SQL your database uh, will not be able to handle. Well, guess what? If it can handle, it won't, uh, it won't fly. You just need to um, uh, get rid of that SQL and rewrite that manually, right? Or uh, tune your ORM framework for the, uh, doing that. Uh, another little tip. Do not leave transactions open because uh, uh, open transactions are very expensive. Uh, you know, bad for database can introduce a lot of bad uh, bad side effects. So make sure to uh, always uh, close transaction right when you are interacting with uh, with user. Another thing uh, I think which is very uh, good to understand for developers is understanding what every database, like actually every system has an optimal concurrency, right? What that means is uh, if you, uh, uh, let's say, create certain amount of threads and uh, use a database from all those threads, it will uh, perform at the uh, optimal level. If you create much more threads, you know, go to thousands of ten of thousands of threads, then performance actually will go down because all that effort which is needed to coordinate those threads, synchronize them, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, that is uh, uh, the consequence of uh, uh, Gunter's universal scalability law uh, decided here. And uh, you better to uh, have idea, at least in a high level, what is that optimal concurrency for your database. Typically, it's going to be tens or maybe hundreds or, or maybe hundred, right, of, uh, of uh, active uh, uh, queries going on at the same time. It's not going to be thousands. Now, how do you mm, deal with that? How do you keep your database operating in the level? Well, you want to make sure what you embrace queuing. That means what you are not sending the quest to their mm, uh, not sending all requests to a database, but uh, maintaining the optimal uh, concurrency in some uh, uh, some case. Sometimes uh, the queuing can be done from uh, you know normal queue. Sometimes the queuing um, kind of magically happens when you're using the connection pooling, right? So, for example, if I am uh, developing in Java and I limit my connection pool to I don't know, let's say. 64 uh, and 128, if I have a spike of a load and I need thousands of database connections, well, I can actually wait for a connection to become available from a pool, right? And uh, limit that uh, load uh, mm, this way. Or I can use tools like a proxy SQL uh, uh, to do that. Finally, in uh, a software such as Percona Server or MySQL Enterprise, there is uh, their uh, thread pool functionality built in, then you can uh, can essentially do that uh, connection pooling on the uh, on the database uh, uh, on a database size. If you think about uh, proxy SQL and other database uh, technologies, there are uh, also similar technologies exist like uh, uh, PostgreSQL has tools like PG Pool, PG Bound uh, Bouncer. Uh, uh, Odyssey, right, and a uh, few hours. 
in general, all those practices, uh, I would sum up like uh, uh, like this, right? I would say they're uh, law of the gravity as it applies to application development, where a uh, shitty application at scale will bring down any database, right? The best tuned, the most expensive, open source, commercial, uh, doesn't matter. That is the universal law of gravity. Okay, a uh, few more tips. A scale matters, right? What you want to make sure is, is what if you're developing and testing a toy database, you're probably not knowing how a query is going to perform. In many cases, it's very convenient, right? You can do it uh, uh, very quickly, you know, reload the database if you need and so on and so forth, right? But make sure you don't go from toy database to production. Make sure you uh, have some staging database or whatever which has a data set which is a uh, similar size and similar kind of a relationship as a production database you expect, right? Uh, especially this is important because slowest queries may slow down most rapidly, right? And you may see uh, some of your bad queries to become thousand times slower when you increase the data size only by 10 times. Memory e disk. That is a related issue, right? Where if data is in memory, it's much faster, even when we're speaking about modern SSDs. So if you are having a small data set which fits in memory on a test box, and then you go into much larger data set, which is additionally doesn't fit in memory and require disk I.O., uh, performance difference can, will be multiplied uh, because of that. Newer is not uh, always faster, right? Upgrading to new software and hardware uh, does not always uh, give you performance uh, uh, benefit. So make sure to test it out. In certain cases, defaults are to blame. Like for example, some of the new Linux kernels have become more secure by defaults, right? In, in terms of all those, you know, security issues with, pro with processors supported over the last couple of years. But uh, that may also made them mm, uh, made them slow, right? And uh, uh, defaults, are, uh, those are often to blame. So make sure you uh, you test uh, you test it out, right? Now the upgrades. When it comes to the databases, uh, this is where you store your data. So t uh, so running the database, which is uh, out of uh, past end of life and often not an option because of uh, uh, security risks. Right, because there may be some security holes found, and there is uh, no patch coming out for uh, for something like MySQL 5.1, right, or PostgreSQL 8. At the same time, the major upgrades often uh, require application changes. So make sure to be uh, to be ready for that and plan in the lifecycle of your application team to uh, support with database upgrades. After uh, uh, after application stop, maybe being developed uh, developed uh, actively, right? Uh, character sets that is another interesting thing because it has a huge performance impact. It's also pain to change after you set it, and also if you have a wrong character set um, or character set mix match between your application uh, and uh, and database. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, right, uh, then mm, uh, uh, that can cause uh, uh, their uh, uh, because uh, they can cause the mm, data loss. Mm, right. Uh, here is uh, also an interesting uh, thing for MySQL in this case about the uh, impact of a character set performance, and you could see in a MySQL five seven actually going from Latin 1 to UTF-8 had a quite uh, uh, different per, uh, uh, different performance. In MySQL 8, a lot of that performance gap was uh, uh, was closed, and uh, MySQL 8 actually has UTF-8 uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by default, right? Why I point this out is relating to a change in default. Some people do complain uh, about the MySQL 8 performance in benchmarks, uh, 
but we don't recognize that MySQL 8 has a different default for character set. Actually, much better one because so much application use smiles those days, right, and so on and so forth, which are only represented well in UTF-8 uh, character set. Another thing to, uh, to consider is the operational overhead. In many cases, when you speak about capacity planning or time uh, which is needed, it's uh, all focused about the normal uh, database operations. But if you think about where things like uh, uh, the you know the large scale database uh, backups or upgrade, even adding the table, they take time. It costs money. It introduces additional overhead uh, when it runs, and you need to make sure there is enough scale capacity to do that. I have seen so many people saying, well, you know what, we can't actually run backup on our database. Well, because when you run backup, our application team tips over. Well, that is not a good capacity planning practice when you can't really, uh, can't really run uh, backup. On the automation. Now, Automation is something which is interesting, right? From one extent, it's of course is absolutely a must, right? We are not able just to manually install and manage a database anymore because uh, many uh, uh, of us have to manage way too many databases, right, uh, this way. So automation is critical. At the same time, that means what the mistakes in the automation can really destroy database at scale. I have seen so many people uh, running the script, let's say, on production instead of test accidentally and uh, ruining the database on hundreds of, uh, of instances, right? What you need to mm, do to avoid mm, this is you want to make sure what there is a lot of testing done for your automation framework and practice which prevent you from running uh, the scripts in development production. Some of those practices are pretty simple. Like for example, do not use the same uh, uh, passwords for development and production. That means even if you accidentally point your script in the wrong way, well, it's uh, it will fail, right? Uh, and uh, and also make sure you QA, do code reviews, right, and so on on your automation from uh, framework because it is uh, needs to be absolutely solid. Uh, then uh, uh, we are finishing up with our mm, uh, security, right? The databases is where your most sensitive data tends to live, right? I think that is um, pretty obvious. And uh, taking care of that data is a shared responsibility of devs and ops. In so many times I've seen developers thinking, well, database security is ops responsibility. They change password, they paste it, uh, uh, they patch it and so on and so forth, right? But that doesn't quite work this way. For example, SQL injections and other bugs, uh, which come with, with, uh, uh, with buggy applications, they cannot be uh, efficiently solved by ops people, right? You need to have uh, make sure that security conversation is had and devs and ops are working, uh, working together to, to resolve it. Okay, uh, with that, I also had a couple of, uh, uh, announcements to make. Now, if you really want to, to learn more about the databases, uh, we at Percona also taking our conference online next week as a Percona Live online, and that will be the single track, 24 hour around the world uh, uh, event. So we're doing it a little bit different format, but uh, uh, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, uh, check it out and register if you like. We have speakers from a lot of the very uh, a very cool uh, company, right? And we'll also share some uh, new developments in the Percona software. And also, mm, I have a little favor uh, to ask. We are doing the open source database uh, survey, uh, right? Uh, 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 we really want to know uh, how you're using the open source database so we can uh, help you, uh, uh, to, will, will help us to serve you better. Uh, to be more focused on our software development. And also we are going to share uh, all the results uh, under a Creative Commons license, right? So there is a link. Uh, yeah, I think you have like a five minutes before closing keynotes. If you uh, open it up on the side and complete right now, I would not mind. And with that, with that I had a 
comment or question from Debbie. Yes, I, I think a point here on whatever it's Postgres or other uh, databases, indeed the old version, they tend to have a very high stability and maturity, uh, but uh, sooner or later, uh, they are not going to be uh, getting uh, bug fixes, right? Even security, bu uh, security bug fixes, and that that means if something something change mm, changes, that uh, uh, becomes uh, uh, problematic, right? Having said that, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, PostgreSQL or MySQL application, which uh, applications which uh, have been you know working fine on the database, which uh, is like 10 years old, uh, uh, old plus, right? They just uh, don't have to follow that uh, security uh, compliance practices, right? Or just have been lucky. Okay. Well, so Nancy, what a, a protocol. I think I am uh, pretty much out of time here. There is a few minutes for you to transition to their uh, closing remarks at uh, 4.50 Eastern. Okay, thank you, Nick. I am glad you all liked the talk. Thank Michael, Tina, and uh, so many, so many uh, others. Oh, yeah, thank you, Abdel, for acknowledging the problem on same password and development and production. That's really takes uh, guts to do it in public. Okay, well, thank you everyone. I'll stop sharing at this point.